realize. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to iFocus Online. Today uh, is lecture number 196 of iFocus Online class and retina session 48. Today's topic is on clinical trials in diabetic retinopathy. And we have none other than Dr. Sabya Sachi Sengupta, who will be teaching us about the same. I request uh, Ritesh sir to please introduce the speaker. Thank you, Marine. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure for me to welcome Dr. Sabya Sachi Sengupta today's, for today's iFocus lecture. Today's topic that Marine talked about was in clinical trials in diabetic retinopathy. Now, diabetic retinopathy is a major problem with us in terms of uh, clinical practice. We see a lot of patients of diabetic retinopathy. At the same time, it's a very important for a postgraduate also because it's an important long question, short question, case. Everywhere you will be encountering diabetic retinopathy. And there are massive amount of trials which are done on it. And it's practically impossible for anyone to cover all of it in an hour. But we are so lucky today to have somebody who is known for being so thorough with analyzing, critically appraising uh, articles, trials, none other than Dr. Sati Sachi Sengupta, a practicing VR surgeon at Future Vision Mumbai, a current associate editor of Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, uh, founder of Sengupta Research Academy, an online portal where he has been teaching us a lot of uh, through his lectures on research methodology and preparation. He has multiple publications to his credit, uh, has won numerous awards. I will not hold him back because I know he has to cover a long topic here. Over to you, Dr. Sadhya Saji. Really, really looking forward to listening to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ritesh, and uh, thanks to uh, you know, CSF education and <clears throat> I focus online for this opportunity and uh, special thanks to Dr. Santosh, you know, who I've been looking up to for so many years. Uh, all right. So we'll get to the topic. Let me share my presentation. All right. I think my screen is visible and I'll go to the full screen. Now, before we get into the nitty gritties of some of these clinical trials in diabetic retinopathy, <clears throat> so I was doing my, uh, uh, research fellowship at uh, Wilmer Institute at Johns Hopkins and the year was 2012-2013 you know a lot of these clinical trials were actually being you know designed some were being designed some were being uh, you know conducted some were being analyzed later on and it, that was not just diabetic retinopathy so I was at a very vibrant place where I actually got to see you know all the different processes that are involved in a clinical trial right from its design to its you know, uh, protocol acceptance to, you know, even funding, and then, you know, how these research coordinates actually carry it out, how data is uh, sort of uh, you know, uh, saved, and then how we actually analyze it. So, uh, you know, so that was a really great experience. And I think that gave me a good insight into clinical trials and how they are conducted. So, you know, I'll share a little bit of, uh, you know, let's call it snippets of some of the major trials that have been conducted in diabetic retinopathy uh, rather recently. So I have no direct financial interest in any of these products and injections that have been that we are going to discuss now. However, I get some remuneration in uh, as a speaker or on the advisory board of some of these companies. So overall, I thought you know we'll discuss the outline. You know, just saying clinical trials is probably a bit dry. So you know, how do we classify this so that we make it interest interesting? And the first thing that we are going to look at, you know, so what we are really going to look at is. Uh, you know, the diabetic retinopathy clinical research network. So that is the biggest uh, group, which is uh, conducting most clinical trials in diabetic retinopathy today. And, you know, for the uninitiated or for residents, it's good to know that clinical trials, uh, you know, they are a very big uh, undertaking involving billions of dollars. So that's with a B. So billions of dollars are required. So there are two major players who conduct these trials. One is industry and one is academia. So, you know, when industry is conducting clinical trials, uh, you know, it's like initial proof of concept where they have come up with a new drug and they want to know whether it works at all. And if it works, how well does it work? And then they want to see whether it works as well as the existing drug that is there. So they are, you know, phases one, two, and three of clinical trials. Uh, when academia conducts clinical trials, there is no financial component really involved in that. And so, 
you know, that is sort of the gold standard clinical trial that we should really be looking up to. And uh, so for diabetic retinopathy, clinical research network is a, is an NIH funded clinical trial or group of clinical trials. We'll see some of them. And, uh, you know, so that's why this DRCR.net is the main study, which, uh, or group of studies that we should be uh, concentrating on. So first thing I thought is we'll take a look at some of the lessons which have been learned from the DRCR.net work. And then you look at the best treatment algorithms for management of diabetic retinopathy, you know, so we give it a streamlined look in terms of, uh, you know, how we manage that. And then we look at uh, how we tailor these to the Indian scenario. So how do we actually bring it to, to our Indian patients? You know, we, we know that there's a lot of differences, not only uh, in the economics and finances of our patients, but also, you know, in the way they present relatively late and have uh, worse disease than, than uh, you know, those clinical trial patients. So we'll have divided the talk into some of these. So first thing is to look at the DRCR.network and the lessons learned so far. So what is this? Uh, all right. So this is really the treated eye of today. If you have a patient with, uh, you know, advanced uh, PDR, then we go ahead and do a uh, panretinal photocoagulation. And this is really how it looks like after, say, five or seven years. And it doesn't look so gruesome when you're actually doing it. But when you see a patient about six, seven, 10 years later, this is really how it looks like. And what we want to see is this is the retina of tomorrow where we want to see a very pristine retina, despite whatever disease we want to actually reverse everything that has happened so far, you know, so uh, that is we want to get from the left to the right. So the ETDRS or the, you know, so the, ET, <coughs> the uh, early treatment of retinopathy study was carried out. Uh, in the previous millennium, you know, so it was carried out in the 1980s and 1990s. From then, a lot of newer modalities for investigations have come up, newer treatment options have come up, and there's been a lot of paradigm shift, or paradigms are changing where people are no longer happy with just 6, six by 24 or 6 by 18. You know, we want to get to 6 by 6 and want to reverse everything. And there is increasing patient expectations in sync with technological advances, uh, advancement. So we need to do more, right? So the ETDR really is outdated, though I'm sure you know, there are a lot of long questions still which are coming on ETDRS, but I'm sure you know, if you look at the papers over the last decade, that those number of questions that are being repeated on the ETDRS are on their way down. So the DRCRNet is really looking at a lot of different uh, scenarios in diabetic retinopathy. And the objective of the DRCR.net is to develop a collaborative network to facilitate multi-center clinical research on diabetic retinopathy, diabetic macular edema, and other retinal diseases. So they want to get people, you know, a lot of uh, retina specialists to come together and work in a collaborative fashion. So the funding, like I had before I said, is it's an NIH funded uh, group of studies. So the National Eye Institute is the subsidiary of the NIH, which actually you know, gives funds for these studies. The National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases, or NIDDK, which is also a subsidy of the NIH. And this was initiated way back in September uh, 2022. All right. So, uh, you know, this is where the Diabetic Retinopathy Clinical Research Network originated from. So the priority initiative is involvement of community-based practices as well as academic or university-based centers. So if somebody is practicing retina and is, you know, maybe seeing only 10 patients in a day, you know, he should also be have, able to participate in a clinical trial and some, you know, another patient sitting in a large, large scale institution who's seeing 100 patients in a day should also be able to participate in a multi-center clinical trial. So that was the priority initiative of this study. So, you know, so collaborate with industry is the second thing where you know, you get industry to also work with you, but with utmost academic integrity, right? So, uh, you know, so uh, no uh, foul play or no mischief in that. So these are some of the priority initiators of the DRCR.network. So, the, you know, so these are some of the protocols which have already been uh, completed from the DRCR.network where, you know, these are, this is protocol A about laser, B is IVTA, uh, you know, these are all the uh, names which have been given. So we'll take a look at some of the important ones here. You know, so uh, all these clinical trials have all already been completed. And there are some which are enrolling, uh, you know, say intervital ranibizumab for uh, PDR. So, you know, it is, it has not, it is finished enrollment now, but so those follow-ups are still going on. And uh, say uh, protocol W has also finished recruiting now, you know, some results are also come out. They are also looking at some genetics uh, in diabetic retinopathy, which is actually still enrolling. So what has been learned so far? So what I'm actually going to tell you is the name of the protocol, you know, and what result they came up with. And we'll start populating a slide so that by the end of it, you, know, you will have one slide with almost all the recommendations from the major DRCR.network uh, studies, right? So the first uh, or the earlier study was uh, the protocol B. And what it said is that over two years, focal grid photocoagulation is more effective 
and has fewer side effects than 1 mg or 4 mg dose of preservative free intrauterine triamcin alone right so even in the early phases the intrauterine triamcin alone really was inferior or was not doing as well as focal grid photocoagulation then came protocol e and it said that in cases of dme with good visual acuity peribulbar triamcin alone with or without focal photocoagulation is unlikely unlikely to be of substantial benefit and those were the days when peribulbar triamcin alone was also a modality of delivery of the drug so the protocol e again you know put to rest the use of triamcin alone for diabetic macular edema so you know this is the summary slide that we will keep building so the first thing that the drci.network said is laser is better than ivtf for diabetic macular edema the second thing it said is posterior subtinan uh, you know does not work for dme next came is protocol i which is relatively large study that is intravitreal ranibizumab with prompt or deferred focal grid laser is more effective through 2 years in increasing visual acuity compared with focal grid laser treatment alone for the treatment of dme involving the central macula it's what it said is inter so this is you know this is the first protocol this was the first report for this was published in 2009 and it clearly showed that interval ranibizumab with prompt or deferred focal grid laser so those were the days when you know people were migrating from focal lasers to intravitreal injections on a mass scale so therefore you know there were arms where you wanted to see whether intravitreal ranibizumab works with laser if you do it at the same sitting or if you do it slightly later that is after 24 weeks you know that is after 6 months of giving the ranibizumab injection so this uh, protocol showed that there was no difference that you can do ranibizumab at you know uh, you can give ranibizumab and then defer focal laser for uh, at least 6 months so focal uh, or grid laser treatment at the initiation of intravitreal ranibizumab is no better and possibly worse for vision outcomes than deferring laser treatment for 24 weeks right so it's clearly showed that don't do focal laser immediately you know so wait for 6 months if you know if you find that there is an indication or that there is persistent fluid and others you can do focal laser you know so the role of focal laser started dwindling away with this protocol i so these are the four arms you know one was sham with grid laser sham is like you know this just like placebo and grid laser it showed about three letters of improvement then the ranibizumab plus prompt laser showed nine letters of improvement ivta with prompt laser was also an arm you know so that showed again four letters and ranibizumab plus deferred laser these are the four arms of this protocol i you know this also showed nine letter improvement so ranibizumab with prompt laser or deferred laser both work well so you know in populating the one liner from the study it says it said monthly ranibizumab monotherapy is best for dme right so that is what this protocol i said and you know this, so this is about a decade back so then you know the whole world started switching to ranibizumab monotherapy for diabetic macular edema then came protocol r and it said that at one year in eyes with non center involving dme this study could not identify a difference between topical nepafenac 0.1% and placebo on oct parameters or or visual acuity so when there is non center involving dme you know generally vision is very good and you know you may see some circinate uh, hard x rays or some amount of leakage but it is not center involving right so then you know you would have seen a lot of people using topical nepafenac to treat this but then this clearly showed that there was no benefit in that so the nepafenac is not better than placebo for non center involving dme next came the protocol t now uh, you know this is a very important protocol and you know perhaps the one that is you know all our treatments are based on even today so we'll take a look at protocol t a little bit with more in detail uh, you know and we'll also be using some of uh, you know this uh, clinical trial in uh, the next class on applying clinical trials to practice right so protocol t really you know so there was a new kid on the block that was called aflibercept uh, you know and that was uh, available for use since uh, 2012 and then you know so everybody said that ranibizumab is great but now what about this new drug we have to study that again you know so then uh, a clinical trial was designed where you had aflibercept given to some patients uh randomly and then bevacizumab that is in 218 patients and ranibizumab uh that is 0.3 mg uh that was given to 218 patients right so we now wanted to see whether aflibercept this new drug is it really good for treating diabetic macular edema you know so the primary uh, end point was at 1 year and change in visual acuity at 1 and 2 years adjusted for baseline visual acuity using the intent to treat principle that's something that we can't go a lot into details with of this intention to treat uh, you know so but what uh, group wise uh, you know what was done was 
uh, or what was planned was aflibercept versus bevacizumab would be studied, aflibercept versus ranibizumab would be studied, and bevacizumab versus ranibizumab would be studied. You know, so even though there are three groups, we are not studying all the three together, right? So we are studying uh, groups of two, right? So we are doing pairwise comparisons. So visits were for every four weeks during the one year, and then for at four to 16 weeks during year two, depending upon the treatment course. And starting at six month visit, focal or grid laser was admissible if DME persisted and was not improving. You know, so this is what we call rescue uh, focal laser. And you know, <clears throat> all this came into existence after the protocol IE that I already showed you. And uh, the doses of uh, that were used were aflibus of two milligram, bevacizumab one point two five milligram, and ranibizumab of zero point three milligrams. Now, so something to note is that you know the commercially available ranibizumab actually zero point five milligram. Uh, you know, but in the US, almost all clinical trials use ranibizumab zero point three milligram. So, the, what was the protocol used? There were patients were given monthly injections for the first six months. You know, unless uh, BCBA was uh, twenty twenty. Uh, that is six by six and OCD thickness was below 250 microns. And then a modified PRN based protocol was used based on BCV and OCT. Why I'm showing you these is because you know, a lot of the treatments that we do today are really based on this protocol T. Uh, so, you know, so the, once you give monthly for six months, uh, you know, then what do you do? How do you, you know, it's not going to just disappear away. So what do you do about DME after that six month period? And so then you look at uh, whether the DME is continuing to improve or worsen. So improvement was classified as OCT central subfield macular thickness of, uh, you know, decreased by more than 10% uh, from the previous visit or visual acuity score improved by more than five letters. That is one snell in line roughly. That is continuing to improve. The other in, uh, you know, definitions for worsening on OCT, uh, where worsening was OCT central subfield thickness increased by 10% from the previous or visual equity letter score decreased by five letters. You know, so, uh, so this is or, right? So if it was continuing to improve or continuing to worsen after that initial loading dose, you know, you would still inject. That is what the protocol was, uh, you know, that is what the protocol uh, T suggested. And the third definition was of course stable. There is no improvement or worsening, right? So uh, that is based on the OCT or visual equity. So inject unless this, you know, unless uh, stable since the last two injections, right? So uh, if there are two injections given and then, you know, it is still stable, you then don't go on to inject, right? But then at least two injections you have to give uh, repeat, uh, you know, one after the other, and only then you can say whether there is stable or not. When I is stable for at least two consecutive injections and OCT and macular thickness is less than 250 microns and vision is 20, 20 or better then defer injection, you know, and when I is stable after at least two consecutive injections and OCT is worse than 2050, uh, 250 and vision is worse than 2020. And, you know, somebody is still in that loading dose period you inject, but after that you defer injections. Right. So, uh, the protocol that was used was monthly loading doses for the first six months and then look at whether it's continuing to improve or continuing to worsen. If that is the case, you keep re-injecting, but as soon as you, you know, attain stability, that is, you know, vision is not improving and vision and the OCT is remaining the same. That is when you stop injecting. So, uh, you know, so this was the protocol that was used in the protocol T. Now, uh, you know, what it was initially planned was to look at some patients who had vision of 20 by 40 or worse, that is six by 12 and worse. Uh, and you know, some people who had vision of six by 12 and better. Yes, so proto <clears throat> in protocol T in patients with baseline vision of 20 by 40 or worse, you know, aflibus have resulted in significantly better vision gains at, uh, than bevacizumab at year two. So if you see this, you know, this is week 52. And then if you follow this, this is week 104. You know, so the aflibus have arm had 18.1 letter gain. You know, that is almost four Snellen lines nearly three and a half to four Snellen lines. That's quite a lot of gain. This is, uh, you know, this is the, uh, 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 this is the, uh, sorry, this is the ranibizumab arm that is 16 letters. And this is the bevacizumab arm that is 13 letters. So if you see these, you know, you will clearly see that the bevacizumab does not do as well as the other drugs. And that is one which one thing which really comes to focus. And at one year, if you see, this is at two years, but at one year, if you see, there was a lot of gap between even aflibercept and uh, ranibizumab. So aflibercept did better than ranibizumab at one year, but that difference was not persistent at two years. 
right and bevacizumab was you know consistently doing worse compared to the other two so avastin doesn't work really as well as the other drugs you know of course there are afford affordability issues which we'll talk later on but from a purely science uh, angle you know bevacizumab is something which is not going to do as well as the other you know better drugs available to us now when we look at you know this is the group where vision was 6 by 12 and better at baseline there was really no difference you know so bevacizumab did as well as ranibizumab and uh, aflibercept as well so there was not much to choose from but when you know vision is worse at baseline that is you know somewhere around 618 or 624 that is what we see in a lot of our patients you know then aflibercept seems to do better than bevacizumab uh, definitely and you know slightly better than uh, ranibizumab also at one year but at two years there doesn't seem to be much difference All right, so this is something that I've already told you. So if aflibercept is superior to ranibizumab at one year, but not at two years, why still consider aflibercept instead of ranibizumab, right? Because it's significantly more expensive. And so when vision is worse at baseline, and you know it's not going to be much different at two years, why should we still consider ranibizumab? You know, so a subgroup analysis was done. So I'll, uh, you know, this is what came off it. This is called the area under the curve. It was significantly greater for aflibercept than with either com uh, comparator over two years. So if you look at, you know, so previously what we were looking at is at each point, at each at week fifty two, then at week hundred four. But then there are many points somewhere in between, isn't it? So what if you could, you know, sort of merge all of them together? So the area under the curve is sort of a it's a you know it's a statistical concept of course and it's sort of a mean of all the means you know so each patient would have multiple visions at different time points you know and at one time point you would have so many patients who are coming in so if you take a mean of all these means you know sort of uh, you know sort of shade all these areas in between you know so between 52 and 68 weeks you shade off all the area so you know what is the overall uh, sort of benefit of these drugs you know so area under the curve helps us to look at uh, you know outcomes over a long term uh, and not at each time but a point alone so in that uh, category you know ailia or uh, aflibercept definitely did better than ranibizumab as well as bevacizumab so it gave about 17 letters consistently 17 letters gain that is about three and a half lines 13 letters about two and a half lines so there was one almost one whole letter uh, line of snellens difference or you know in this case ettdr is difference between the <coughs> aflibercept and the ranibizumab and uh, you know so this is only in patients who have vision worse than 2050 that is 618 and uh, worse than 612 so that is 618 and worse uh, aflibercept seems to be doing overall slightly better than ranibizumab but the sort of overall you know the thing that really glaringly stares at you is that bevacizumab is definitely not as good as the other two drugs so the superiority of aflibercept over ranibizumab is uh, you know through at least one year Uh, which is a substantial amount of time for an individual to be more likely to experience superior vision isn't it so uh, you know people say kal kisne dekha hai but uh, so at one year even if you can get uh, you know patients to get bet seeing better so uh, aflibercept patients will see better and much earlier than ranibizumab right so over two years it's all going to even out but uh, the overall uh, you know sort of the better gain will be seen with patients who get aflibercept and now this is you know important to note that this is only for those who had 618 and worse vision so in this uh, in the protocol t said that aflibercept is better than bevacizumab at two years and there was no difference with ranibizumab at two years though at one year it was definitely better especially in the subgroup who had 618 and worse vision next protocols which we won't go too much into detail uh, the protocol f said that results uh, suggest clinically meaningful differences are unlikely in oct thickness or visual acuity following application of prp in one sitting compared with four sittings now generally we do prp in three or four sittings so you know what this uh, study found out is that there is not much difference so routine prp in one sitting can also be undertaken if patient tolerates it and importantly multi spot prp which are now available in one sitting is safe and effective and this is what this uh, trial said so you need not really keep calling patients back for three sittings if you have a multi spot prp uh, you know it can actually be done in one sitting if patient is tolerating so prp can be completed in, in one sitting is the next summary uh, you know from the drcr.network next was protocol j so these are certain small protocols which a lot of people don't uh, probably look at but you know, so what this said is that the addition of one intravitreal pramcinor injection or two intravitreal ranibizumab injections in eyes receiving focal grid laser for dme and prp is associated with better visual acuity and decreased macular edema by 14 weeks so what this means is you know if somebody has a combination of pdr and and dme you know that is something which Uh, you know most of us would not like to see in our patients so you know where prp 
is needed for the PDR component and the injections are needed for the diabetic macular edema. So what this protocol, though it's a smaller protocol, it uh, clearly you know, showed that uh, when patients have PDR with DME, then an intravitreal anti-VGF agent definitely helps. So adding ranibizumab to PRP in eyes with PDR with DME was beneficial. Then came other smaller protocols. Again, you know, protocol N, it said ranibizumab versus saline in PDR with vitreous hemorrhage. So this it said that the study suggested little likelihood of a clinical important difference between ranibizumab and saline on the rate of vitrectomy by 16 weeks. Short-term secondary outcomes, including visual activity improvement, increased PRP completion rates and reduced recurrent vitreous hemorrhage suggest biological activity of ranibizumab. Right. So the you know, so what this says is that if somebody comes with a fresh vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, and if you inject ranibizumab, what it will, you know, it is not likely, it is not likely to quickly clear up that vitreous hemorrhage, right? So uh, there is little likelihood of sudden improvement. However, overall, uh, you know, there seems to be certain uh, advantages where it helps in, uh, you know, in PRP completion or, uh, you know, overall, it may help slightly in the long run, but uh, injecting uh, uh, you know, ranibizumab for somebody who has a fresh vitreous hemorrhage is probably not the best way to go. So ranibizumab is not superior to saline for PDR with vitreous hemorrhage. Then came another uh, uh, very, uh, very important study, which was, you know, which has been looked at from many different angles. That's called the protocol S. Uh, so they will take a little bit of, uh, you know, take a, a little, slightly more uh, detailed look at this. So, you know, what it did is prompt PRP versus ranibizumab plus deferred PRP for PDR. This was eyes with purely PDR. There was no DME component, uh, you know, at least at the uh, onset of the study. And it, uh, what it did is prompt PRP, which is what we would sort of, you know, recommend to most of our patients, uh, versus, you know, only ranibizumab monotherapy at the beginning without any PRP. And you could do deferred PRP at a later stage. So it randomized 305 patients, uh, to a total of 394 eyes at 55 sites. And the study, I am meeting all the following inclusion criteria. That is, they had PDR. There was no history of PRP in the past. The best corrected visual activity score was, uh, you know, uh, better than 24 letters. That is 6 by 320. That's roughly 3 by 60. And eyes with or without entry involving DME were eligible. So what it showed overall is, you know, when you look at... Uh, Sorry, when you look at, uh, you know, this is ranibizumab, it had 191 patients and PRP group had 203 patients. Uh, you know, so these, uh, any retinal detachment was seen in 6 and 10% overall uh, in the ranibizumab and PRP groups. Neovascular glaucoma, you know, it was still seen in 2% uh, in ranibizumab and 3% in the PRP group. Iris neovascularization was seen, was also seen, but very, you know, very less as we expect. Vitreous hemorrhage happened in 27% who had ranibizumab monotherapy and in 34% who had uh, PRP alone. And overall, if you look at vitrectomy rates, you know, the ranibizumab group definitely had lower rates of vitrectomy compared to PRP, which had 15% rates of vitrectomy. And this was statistically significant. Overall, <clears throat> so fundus photos were graded at a reading center. And, uh, you know, what is more surprising is Oh, sorry, what is most surprising is the bottom line. So persistent or active neovascularization, it was seen in 42% of patients with ranibizumab at two years. So almost half of the patients continue to have active neovascularization. And uh, well, that was seen, uh, the same thing was seen in PRP group as well. That, so they had persistent active neovascularization at that is 46%. That's really high, you know, so we don't see, uh, I'm sure, you know, the retina specialists in the group as well as, you know, Ritesh and others would agree that we don't see that high uh, number of active or persistent neovascularizations uh, after we do a PRP at two years follow-up, you know, so, so these were slightly surprising results, but overall it seemed that ranibizumab and prompt PRP were very similar to each other in terms of, uh, you know, all these outcomes when you're treating a treatment knife PDR. So overall conclusions from the protocol S were that PRP is effective for PDR over the last four decades and remains effective in the 21st century as well. So I've taken these right from, you know, the published paper. Ranibizumab for PDR is at least as good as PRP for visual activity at two years. So ranibizumab is an effective uh, uh, treatment alternative. You know, let's not say it's a treatment of choice, but it's an alternative to existing PRP that we do today. There were no substantial safety concerns for at least two years. Maybe the preferred initial treatment approach for some patients, uh, for example, those who have both PDR and DME. And so this is a cohort or a subgroup whom we would, uh, you know, we could even think about doing ranibizumab monotherapy because they have PDR as well as DME. And this antivirus is going to act on PDR as well as DME. 
avoid ranibizumab when there is substantial traction components in the PDI. You know, so when the neovascularization has grown into the posterior vitreous and there is a lot of traction, uh, you know, this uh, this is going to get worsened with these antivirals. So one liner from this study was that ranibizumab may be the preferred initial treatment approach for some patients. For example, those who have both PDR and DME. Then came protocol U, which has also been, you know, sort of rather criticized more than uh, more than looked at positively. So uh, what it did is short-term evaluation of combination dexamethasone plus ranibizumab versus ranibizumab alone in eyes with persistent DME and vision imp impairment. You know, so it happens that you know when you have treated patients and uh, with ranibizumab, there is a substantially large number of patients who continue to keep having persistent fluid despite repeated injections. So what do you do with them? So what the study did is, did is that it gave additional dexamethasone implant and continued the ranibizumab uh, for some patients. And in the other group, they only continued ranibizumab without giving dexamethasone. You know, so if you look at the overall uh, scenario and this is the protocol T, you know, how many percent patients would you expect to have persistent DME at six months follow-up? You know, so if you look at the aflibercept arm, you know, that was about 32%. So 48% uh, had some fluid, but 32% had persistent DME in the bevacizumab arm overall, it is 66%. That's really high, right? So we know that bevacizumab doesn't really dry it as well. Vision doesn't improve so much. But if you look at how many have persistent fluid, that is also a very high number. And if you look at ranibizumab, you know, overall it's about uh, 41%. So, uh, so about at least a third of the patients continue to have fluid even after you give treatment as per protocol T, right? So that's a very large number. What do you do with these patients? So what the study did is, uh, you know, so of course ranibizumab was given at uh, the loading doses, that is week zero, week four, and week eight. And at week 12, you looked at them. Uh, you know, so uh, if they had persistent fluid, what they did was give additional dexamethasone along with ranibizumab, and they gave uh, ranibizumab with sham, which is the placebo. And then you know, keep following up, and at every three months, you could repeat a dexamethasone if there was persistent fluid. And here you would just do sham. So you know, one group is basically just keep continuing uh, the patient on ranibizumab, that is at a weekly interval, keep continuing that. And in the other group, you keep continuing ranibizumab, but keep uh, you know, add dexamethasone at uh, at three monthly intervals. So what you know, so overall the number of patients were relatively small with uh, 65 uh, in the combination group and 64 in the random in the uh, ranibizumab monotherapy group uh, so this is a relatively busy slide but you know what really we want to see is the primary outcome is you know it was at 24 weeks after initial onset uh, you know, so mean randomization visual letter score after the combination group was 63 letters and the randomism map was about 60, uh, 64 letters. So this is slightly below, uh, you know, this is uh, slightly below 624 if you look at uh, Snellen's equivalent. Mean visual equity change during run-in for these patients. So this is at baseline, right? So uh, they had about three letters improvement with randomism map alone. And then they all, of course, had persistent uh, fluid. So what happened to visual acuity in these two arms, if you look, you know, the ranibizumab and the combination arms, both again gained only about three letters uh, that is at uh, 24 weeks, that is after six months of uh, giving these drugs. So adding dexamethasone to that uh, additional uh, dexamethasone to the ranibizumab did not seem to improve vision. Uh, but if you look at the thickness, you know, if this is ranibizumab, this was combination. So combination definitely led to more dry maculas. Uh, over a six month follow up. So, if you get dexamethasone, it looks great on the OCT, but unfortunately, vision does not improve. Right. So, uh, also, if you look at safety, about 20% patients started having uh, glaucoma or raised intraocular pressure in the combination. That's because of the dexamethasone. So, overall conclusions were that mean vision improved by uh, improvement by six months was no better in the dexamethasone plus ranibizumab group than in <coughs> sham plus ranibizumab. Right. So, adding dexamethasone doesn't really help much. So the one liner in this summary slide from uh, protocol uh, U was that dexamethasone implant is useful to reduce macular edema more efficiently when used in combination with ranibizumab in non-responders, uh, but BCV does not seem to improve at all, right? So that is uh, that is protocol U. Uh, then came another interesting protocol, which is called protocol V. You know, this is for treatment for center involving DME in eyes with good visual acuity. And this is not very uncommon, you know, where we see there is a center involving a macular edema, you know, the thickness is something like 310, 320 microns. There are some few cysts here and there, but vision is sometimes 6, 6, sometimes 6 by 9. So these are center involved DME in eyes with good visual acuity. So what do you do with them? Do you treat them? Do you observe them? You know, so there is a this sort of overall conundrum. So this uh, protocol, we gave a good idea how to do 
So, you know, how should we treat eyes with center involved DME and vision of 2025? That is six, nine, six, seven, six by seven point five or better. And you can either give them anti VEGFs, you can think about doing a focal a grid laser, or you could just observe them, right? So that is, you know, so that was a sort of a dilemma. We don't want vision to drop, but then you know, we don't want to unnecessarily treat patients as well, right? So over, overall. Uh, what the study did is, it, did is it gave patients aflibercept, it uh, did laser plus aflibercept and just observation, right? So this is what uh, was done in the study. Uh, in the aflibercept uh, monotherapy, there were 226 patients in the laser with aflibercept, 240 patients and only observed 236. And that's, you know, so this is relatively good numbers here. Uh, when you look at this, you know, more than five letter loss at two years, really did that happen in the observation group? I mean, you're not treating them at all. About 19% patients lost vision in the aflibercept group. That is also 16%, you know, so despite treatment, still about 16% lost vision and in the laser with aflibercept still 17%. So it's all very similar, right? So you, uh, so from this slide, what you can see is that, you know, it may not help to start treating these patients who, who have extremely good vision of six by nine or better. You know, so if you look at five letter gain before we looked at five letter loss, now, if you look at five letter gain in the observation, that has also happened in about 21%. So remember they already have slightly good vision. Now, so they went from six, nine to six, six, right? So that's five letter or one line gain. So in observation also that happened in about 21% in aflibercept, of course, it happened slightly better, but then, you know, you're giving it, uh, you're giving so many injections for a period of time of two years. So it's again, probably unnecessary. So the one line of the from this study is that, you know, observe eyes with center involving DME and good baseline vision of six by nine or better. Don't treat them right away. If there is, you know, if they go below six by 12 or they become worse than six by 12, then of course you have to treat them. And then, uh, there was another uh, protocol. This is called protocol W. It said, does anti vegas in moderate to severe NPDR prevent center involving DME and PDR development, right? So now we are looking purely at a sort of a, you know, we are going towards prevention, isn't it? We want to prevent patients from going to macular edema and to PDR. So when you catch patients early enough in say moderate to severe NPDR, should you start injecting in them, right? With the uh, overall long-term objective of preventing macular edema as well as, uh, uh, you know, PDR. So what this really said is that the two, two year cumulative probability of developing center involving DME with vision loss of PDR was 16.3% with aflibercept versus 43.5% with CHAM, right? So overall large. In PDR, 13.5% in the aflibercept group versus 33.2 in sham. Right? So again, this PDR numbers are being reduced. Center involving DME, 4.51% in the aflibercept group versus 14.8 in the sham group. So that is again a, quite a large difference. But then there was no effect on BCVA despite aflibercept injections. You know, so you are having, uh, you know, obviously you are having, you are injecting these patients who have good vision, they're perfectly normal. You know, otherwise you would be observing them, but then if you inject, you know, does it help? So what this said is, yes, the numbers of PDR is lesser. The incidence of center involving DME is lesser, but if this DME happens, you know, or if PDR develops, then, you know, the vision is going to still be bad despite getting multiple aflibercepts in the past. Right. So in moderate to severe NPDR, aflibercept reduces the risk of vision threatening diabetic retinopathy. But if that happens, you know, the vision is still going to drop, right? So uh, overall from a uh, developing world kind of scenario where there are a lot of costs and, you know, a lot of trials and tribulations uh, associated with uh, giving intravitreal injections on a repeated basis, this probably doesn't seem to be such a great idea uh, overall, right? So the main outcomes for practice, you know, so that's, uh, these are all the trials that I wanted to sort of, you know, bring across to you where, you know, we looked at how it has evolved from protocol I to protocol. So, you know, so initially we knew that IVTA doesn't work, but focal grid works. So focal grid laser was, uh, part of the future trials, you know, then we saw how ranibizumab became mainstay and then ranibizumab monotherapy became mainstay and, you know, laser was thought about as a deferred treatment or as, a, uh, as a rescue treatment. Then when aflibercept has come in, you know, there are hardly any studies now, which have any laser monotherapy arm. If at all, there are, they are now, you know, combined with others. So, uh, you know, this is how it has evolved over time where, you know, IVTA has lost its charm right in the beginning. And then, uh, you know, the next three, four years, uh, laser started taking a back seat and then ranibizumab took center stage. Now aflibercept is, uh, has sort of gained, uh, importance, especially if vision at baseline is worse than six by 12 overall. So, you know, and a lot of these other protocols that I've uh, put together. So the main outcomes for practice are that aflibercept is better than bevacizumab at two years, you know, but there is no difference with ranibizumab at two years. Ranibizumab may be the preferred initial treatment approach for some patients with PDR, especially those with coexisting DME. 
right so pdr with dme consider uh, ranibizumab uh, you know you may consider as combined with prp or you may consider even it as, as a monotherapy if pdr is there alone then laser prp is still the number one treatment of choice right there without dme dexamethasone implant useful to reduce macular edema but more efficiently when used in combination with ranibizumab in non non responders but bcva does not seem to improve you know then observe wise with center involving dme and good baseline vision of 6 by 9 or better and in moderate to severe npdr aflibrutinib reduces the risk of vision threatening retinopathy but not bcva you know, so this is the overall outline that we started with in terms of uh, drcr and how it has you know revolutionized practice and so far what we have looked at is some of the recommendations of the drcr then now we look at the best treatment algorithms for management of dme you know how which drug to use how often to treat you know so the best treatment protocols of dme what do evidence based guidelines say and the overall is which drug you know which has better which gives better vision which has better drying which uh, lasts longer than the other which has minimum side effects so these are some of the questions that are always there in our minds now so this is again from the protocol t where we looked at aflibercept versus ranibizumab you know what about better vision you know so aflibercept had about 18 letter gain and 58% patients had three line improvement that's more than half in ranibizumab it was 16 letters and about 46% had three line improvement so overall slightly aflibercept seems to be nudging it uh, nudging bevacizumab uh, or, or sorry ranibizumab a better drying you know aflibercept had about 130 micron decrease at two years almost the same with ranibizumab longer lasting or durability you know aflibercept really we are giving only at eight week you know maximum uh, we are giving at about four week or sometimes at eight week intervals but then you know it sometimes even lasts longer than that so that has not really been tested in uh, clinical trials uh, and so as ranibizumab some patients actually it effect lasts for six weeks or even eight weeks that is something that we don't know side effects are minimum with both and if you look at the cost it's definitely higher with ranib uh, with aflibercept compared to ranibizumab it's at least in the in indian scenario uh you know so <clears throat> overall looking at it they both really perform uh, slightly better uh, i mean uh, they perform very similar but aflibercept seems to be superior when vision and uh, you know it is there is worse vision at baseline which is more common in the indian scenario the <clears throat> you know the protocol of retreatment for dm is these are you know, some of the major papers which have been published so this is the international council of ophthalmology recommendation for screening follow up and referral you know, so what this is so i'll quickly go to the you know this is when do you examine you know so this is when you treat retreat you know so this is the 10% cst or central subfield macular thickness and five letter rule is something that we should remember and you know, this is really distilled from all the trials and this is what retreatment is all about you know so 10% cst and five five letter rule so worsening or improvement you know this is based on these when it's worsening there is 10% uh, you know cst increase and there is uh, you know five letter reduced from previous visit in improvement cst there is uh, it has it has reduced by more than 10% and vision has improved by about five letters so 10% cst and five letter rule is what really we look at and you know that's a good thing to remember when you are actually sitting in front of a patient and practicing uh, and when it's stable it's really between these limits you know so and finally we are aiming for about 6 by 9 or better always uh you know so this is what the this uh, paper which was published in ophthalmology said if there is diabetic macular edema you assess if there is uh, you know mild to moderate npdr and there is non center involving dme then you can do a focal or grid laser or you can just observe if there is moderate to severe npdr and there is center involving dme you know so there is definite center involving dme which is very clearly seen on the oct and if vision is better than 6 by 9 you know then what you can do is just observe or you can do a focal or grid laser which is away from the fovea you know these are all from this now you know this is from the protocol uh, u that we looked at if there is 6 by 9 or worse you know then definitely you think about anti vegf therapy and in anti vegf therapy when you are starting you have to do a loading dose of monthly for 3 months and then assess uh, one month after the initiation you know after this uh, loading dose if there is dme improvement or worsening you know if there is continuing improvement or there is definite worsening from the previous injection if there is rest yes you need to reinject and return after a month if there is no improvement or there is no worsening and that is it is stable and this should be for at least two visits you know then you need not inject and then do you return after one month if there is worsening of dme again 
uh, you know, of course, you go and re-inject. If there is no worsening, you can, in, you know, increase the follow-up intervals by about a month or a couple of months as you see best fit, right? So, at the center of it is about whether the DME is improving or worsening. And that the initiation is loading doses, right? So, loading dose for the first three months, and then you see whether there is DME improving or worsening. Now, this is basically, you know, catered to each individual patient. So, this is called PRN or Prurinata or as and when needed, right? So, it is based on OCT as well as uh, visual activity. So in summary, you know, get the macula as dry as possible, vision is close to 6.9 and vision as close to 6.9 as possible, stop when both of these are achieved or when no change after two consecutive injections is happening. Now, so this is the second thing that we looked at, then quickly we look at how to tailor these for the Indian scenario. We know that the, you know, there are a lot of financial constraints for our patients. Choice of injection is based on affordability and not always on science, right? So, uh, you know, that's something that we really need to understand. And bevacizumab gives about 70% drying and about 1.5 line lower vision. So most of the times you're going to see unhappy patients uh, if you choose bevacizumab. So I, I haven't really given bevacizumab for almost uh, two years now because I don't believe that it, you know, really helps. But, uh, you know, that's, of course, open to debate. But even if you look at clinical trials and outcomes, uh, you know, this really doesn't do well. So in India, if you look about 3.5 injections per year in India is given. So these are all really suboptimal numbers. And, you know, factors affecting compliance of intravitreal anti vegfs in Indian scenario, if you look at a very nice study done in Pune, uh, you know, the third of the patients said they couldn't afford, but the third said vision did not improve much. Right? So that's a very high number where... Uh, our patients probably expect more than what uh, you know we can deliver. Uh, you know, so how we can improve this adherence for patients is by you know offering or telling them about insurance coverage, which is now widespread in India. Uh, there are many patient assistance programs uh, from the pharma world where you know Novartis, Bayer, and Intas also offer uh, certain subsidized uh, you know injections for if you take initial couple of injections. There is, uh, you know, improving adherence can also be done by better counseling in terms of risks of uh, not treating and likely damage caused due to under treatment. Uh, this is something that we'll look at the, uh, the next week of how we can actually apply clinical trials to practice. And there are certain points there also, which will help you improve adherence. Uh, lastly, you know, do we need repeat injections? Uh, a lot of the times I keep getting asked, you know, do I really need to keep giving so many injections? Initiation of treatment is really obvious, isn't it? If anybody sees a treatment naive patient with DME, you are going to start injecting. All clinical trials mandate a loading dose. So I would definitely recommend an initial loading dose. Uh, most patients won't be willing for monthly injections. So how do you ensure good vision with minimum number of injections in DME, right? That is sort of the holy grail of, of all these. You know, so what I do or what my way is to inform patients of the need for multiple injections and then the choice of injection based on their affordability and whether they have insurance coverage, inform the best regimen. So explain that the need for five to six injections per year in the first year and then reducing number of injections later on right at the onset. Think about a loading dose, which is the best way to start. Re-inject based on OCT and BCVA and you know, do not switch uh, to different injections prematurely and consider after minimum of two doses and remember that 10% CST and one line BCVA rule or five letter BCVA rule, right? When in doubt, inject or over towards uh, over rather than under treatment. Uh, I think uh, we don't have enough time on these. So I'll skip, you know, these are some biomarkers. So these are hyperreflective foci, which tell you that there's more inflammation and maybe dexamethasone would uh, help. Uh, this is dis disorganized retinal inner layers. You know, there you can't differentiate one layer from the other. And these are poor prognostic indicators and don't inject in most of them. Uh, <clears throat> some future directions are reversal of PDR to NPDR, reversal of severe NPDR to mild NPDR, uh, using anti vegfs you know, the outcomes of some other clinical trials are out. OCT and geography and decision making is also going to probably, you know, uh, invade our spaces more and more. Uh, quantify fluid in nanoliters using volumetric analysis of on scans is also very much, uh, we are looking forward to how we look at OCT in slightly different ways. And artificial intelligence based retreatments are of course really going to invade uh, you know, all our, uh, you know, privacy with our patients. So that is really coming soon. We should, you know, sort of look out for some of those. So practical take-home message finally is that, you know, in DME start with loading doses and then uh, based on PRN, uh, then switch to PRN, then multiple injections will still be needed. You need to counsel at baseline. OCT-based re-injection, that is five letter or one line drop in CMT, uh, increment by 10% from previous visit, you need to, you know, definitely inject here. If there are non-responders, identify them and switch or look at some OCT parameters of why they are, non, they are not responding. Communication is crucial. Take patients into confidence. Uh, this is my uh, editorial in February 2021 on current, current pers perspectives on anti-VEGFs and, you know, you might want to take a look at some of them. Thank you so much and I'm happy to take questions if you have them. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Sabesachi. That was wonderful, actually. I don't know how did you, you somehow managed to cover every important point there. Yes, yeah, so it was just, you know, this is just the headlines of most of the trials, except for the two or three that we should look into details. And that was a protocol T and the protocol S. And so I think we dived a little bit into that. Uh, so there are a couple of questions you can see in my chat box and take those first. Uh, Nefafinite topical eye drops compared with placebo both in CME also, as also DME mentioned in protocol T. I didn't understand the question. Dr. Soini, are you there? Yes, sir. sir uh, I, uh, my doubt was uh, Nefafinic drops are not uh, uh, having an efficacy in uh, cystoid macular edema uh, or only diabetic macular edema, they are not uh, like compared with the placebo, they are having the same effect. I mean, post operative cystoid macular edema. Yes. Not... Okay. So the protocol T, as far as I, I understand, it was only looking at diabetic macular edema. It was not looking at post operative cystoid macular edema. Okay. Dr. Sabe Sachin. Yeah, so basically, you know, I think, yeah, you're, so cystoid macular has so many causes, right? So diabetic macular is only one cause of CME, but then there are so many causes you know, like post-operative or, you know, sometimes even rare causes like retinitis pigmentos and others. So currently we are discussing about diabetic macular and then, you know, it really doesn't work in DME and, uh, you know, but we see so many people are getting advice that, uh, you know, repeatedly, but it's, it doesn't work and doesn't help much. So, and that is backed by clinical trials also. So probably not a great idea to keep prescribing Nepafinac for DME. She also wants to know how many protocols we are bound to remember sir, for the exams. Yes. Yeah, so I think that's a great question. From an exam point of view, I think, you know, first and foremost is the protocol T because it's not only because it's one of the more recent protocols, uh, but, uh, you know, that is, you know, most of the uh, sort of uh, treatment patterns that I taught, told you today are based on the protocol T. So that is something that you must understand and read as far as you can, as deeply as you can, right? So there are many different outcomes and different papers which are based on protocol T. You know, one is looking at vision, one is looking at uh, OCT, you know, one is looking at uh, re-injection rates, where there are other papers which are looking at uh, OCT biomarkers, which are predicting outcomes and so on. So protocol T is something that you must know. Uh, the other, uh, before the one which is preceding that was protocol I, you know, where, which really showed us that, uh, you know, laser is probably better as a deferred approach. So protocol I, protocol T, the new new protocols like protocol S, which are looking at anti-VEGF monotherapy for PR, uh, you know, instead of PRP for PDR, right? So that's sort of a very, you know, something that you know, we would shudder as retina specialists in India. You know, this, a lot of patients wouldn't come back and they would have a lot of vision loss, but that is also something that you must read. And a lot of the Western world is all moving towards treating uh, PR, you know, PDR with anti-VEGFs alone. So that is something you must also know. So you know, these are three more important protocols that uh, have really influenced the way we practice. And I think you should definitely know. So that's protocol I, protocol T and protocol S. Uh, do we have any questions on YouTube? Yeah. So the most uh, common question is uh, the one which Swaini asked. Uh, most important ones, which Sarah has already answered. Another question is, uh, can you give some practical tips to remember these protocols? Uh, you know, so uh, practical tips, you know, read. Uh, there is a major review or that's a, uh, you know, so let me try and pull out the, that is, you know, if you even read one of these papers, it's, it's pretty good enough to understand and remember what is happening, you know, so, uh, this is guidelines on diabetic eye disease, which is published in uh, American Academy of Ophthalmology by T. N. Wong. Mm -hmm. you know, so that is a good paper which talks of. So these these are ICO, you know, International Council of Ophthalmology or ICO based guidelines. So you can just Google it up. ICO guidelines for the diabetic retinopathy by Wong, W O N G, Wong et al. I mean, uh, most retina specialists would know who's T. N. Wong, but you know, as residents, it would, would be great to you know track his career as well. He's one of the great personalities in vitro retina as well as in ophthalmology today. So you know, that is one uh, paper which really tabulates uh, you know all these clinical trials very nicely. 
there is another way to remember and do it in is look at aao ppp that is preferred practice patterns you know so uh, especially you know so uh, like for uh, amd there is a cheat sheet you know that is one sheet where all major clinical trials are given in one place you know so the first column is about the name of the trial the second column is about inclusion exclusion criteria for all trials one below the other you know the third is about uh, you know how many patients in each arm then there is one column on how many had 15 letter improvement or you know uh, 15 letter loss and things like that then what are the complications so you know if you get something like that so, you know the uh, american academy of ophthalmology preferred practice patterns are one very good place where all these trials are given in one place uh, you know so the the latest ppp for dr does not actually have a cheat sheet the previous one did have so you know you could look at how the amd ppp looks like and you know how those clinical trials are all given in one page and then you know based on that you could actually make some for dme for rvo and for all the other diseases that you want to for sure there is no mnemonic or something which you have that you can remember the trial and personally not i could get it out of this word of yeah there is in the name this one is the which as uh, how do you follow up a uh, diabetic macular edema patients and how often do you do oct Yeah, so you know, <clears throat> giving injections is one thing, but you know, at least examining them, we should definitely follow uh, trial protocols as far as possible. You know, so see patients every four weeks. So what I do is, you know, of course, in the initial loading dose, uh, week zero, that is, at you give the first injection, then at one month, and then at two months. So these are three loading doses that I give. Of course, I do OCT at every visit. and then uh, you know what i am doing is i am looking at whether there is any worse so after three loading doses i look at whether there is any worsening or there is any improvement or it's remaining stable as such you know and accordingly then i look at you know so if once patient attains stability that is they are not requiring any more injections for at least 2 to 3 months then i start increasing their you know follow up periods uh, say 2 3 months and then 4 months if possible Uh, and then i do oct only when they visit so initially it has to be more intensive so you know if if i want to put it in a nutshell or a one fits all rule it's for the first 6 months you should definitely see them once a month and do octs every month after that you know if you if if you think patients are going to keep needing injections frequently then you know probably still follow them up more uh, frequently if you think Uh, they are not going to need too many injections. Then you could actually not do that many. But at least six months, monthly for six months uh, examination and OCT, I think is a must. So I think this question is because uh, uh, you mentioned that you have not used bevacizumab. There hmm. has it has bevacizumab totally gone out of practice. Uh, yeah, you know that's a great question. Overall, you know not just the efficacy, but you know we also look at safety, isn't it? So. uh you know bevacizumab has had its own share of uh, you know uh, shock events if you want to call it that you know so where the huge number of patients have had endophthalmitis uh, clusters have happened so you know so that is what uh, gives you the shudder sometimes so bevacizumab you know it's we know all know and agree that it is not as safe as the others right because it's uh, you know multiple prick or aliquoting or whatever that may be so bevacizumab is definitely not safe or safe enough uh it is definitely not as efficacious as the others like i've already shown you you know so uh, nitpicking and you know even actually looking at some of the trial excel sheets which are actually available on the drcr.network i have taken a close look at them and bevacizumab doesn't match even for uh vision or for ocd for that matter so it is not as safe it is not as efficacious what it is is only cheap isn't it so then uh, you know you need you take a call in terms of how you want to balance all these safety efficacy and uh, you know cost effectiveness also you know you know if you look at cost effectiveness that is a health economics term so cost effectiveness cost utility <clears throat> and uh, you know cost benefit and so on the others so even looking at some of those you will realize that bevacizumab is not cost effective even in the long run it is not as cost effective so patients are going to keep losing vision they are going to have more unhappy patients uh so i would say, you know what i do is i would still probably forego a few patients in my routine practice uh but you know still stick to not giving bevacizumab it's not as effective it is definitely not as safe it is only cheaper so you know so for an aspiring country like india where the you know the gdp is going high and you know patients are now actually starting to earn back with insurance a lot of them actually do have insurance coverage i see bevacizumab on its way down if not totally out 
so for all these trials and protocols, I mean, uh, what is the, how do, how do you get the ethical clearance? I mean, uh, that part. Can you please tell that? You know, so the, it, any any trial or any protocol or any study for that matter has to really answer something. And the question that you are asking has to be, uh, you know, worth ask, asking, isn't it? It really has to be worth pursuing. So. You know, so if you look at, you know, like I told you, uh, each of these studies, uh, what I posed is the question that the study asked and the answer that the study found, isn't it? That's how I presented to you. And that's why it also makes sense. Instead of seeing how many arms and how much this and that, it's probably not something that most people want to remember, right? But you want to see what question was asked and what answers you got. So from an ethics point of view, what is only important is the question that you're asking. And is it the question that is important for us to answer? If the question is yes, you know, then the then the study is uh, scientifically sound, right? So the ethics really you know, bottom of the pyramid is science. If the science is wrong, it's unethical. Once uh, you know, once the science is right, then you of course look at ethical uh, questions in terms of you know whether whether you are uh, you know what are the other things that you're doing and whether your consent form is right and you know whether you're only uh, you know say for example in the US if there are studies which have predominantly African American populations you know that that's looked upon uh, looked down upon and things like that so then you look at some ethical questions there but first and foremost I think the question has to be worth asking that's uh, that's the most important that most studies look at. Maybe just to add a small point uh, Dr. Sabisa Chief you agree with me on that most of these trials when or any trial when you're conducting, especially on a new drug or a new protocol, there has to be a very strong safety review committee and safety network also. So there are interim safety checks which are done in each of these trials. And at any stage, if they find the trial moving away in terms of patient safety, so ethics committee do look at all those aspects whether you're taking safety of the patients into account or not. So, so that's that a great part. point. Uh, that's a great point. You know, so very recently it has happened that one of the I won't name the drug or or the trial, but you know, a drug which was given uh, very frequently has caused a lot of inflammation in vein occlusion uh, patients, and that actually study has been withdrawn. You know, so then and you know who has found this is the safety uh, monitoring committee. So so what this has brought up is I think really important. So ethics committee look, looks at all of these as well. You know, is there a monitoring committee? You know, what are your uh, pro policies for uh, you know compensating patients in case there is an adverse event and all of those things so some integrities are there so you know so all of this mixed together to bring the ethics committee oh, that's all the questions we have uh, dr sachi i have one question for you before we close on uh, apart from the drcr in regards diabetic trials for the post what historical or trial to prepare for the exam, what would you recommend as of today? Yes, yeah, so, you know, of course, like, uh, like I said in the beginning, uh, there are mainly industry driven trials and academia driven trials. So this is the biggest academia driven trial, which I spoke to you about. And then there are industry driven trials, you know, where, uh, where you give the drug and compare it with a sham or a placebo, right? So you give ranibizumab and you don't give anything or you give uh, maybe another arm where there is a focal laser as well. So, you know, so those studies in the beginning in diabetic macular edema were called the rise and the right trials. And then there was a restore trial. We don't have enough time to talk about all of those, you know, so those are sort of like initial proof of concept studies, which the company wants to know itself, whether the phase three trial is going to bring out similar results like the phase one and phase two. But then of course, you know, there are a lot of uh, in, uh, sort of commercial interests involved in some of those uh, not that they are wrong scientifically, but you know, uh, as you can see, so that's why I haven't discussed some of those. So if you want to make a list of them, you know, so the rise, ride and restore are for the diabetic macular edema with ranibizumab in the early phases. And then the vivid and the vista for uh, aflibercept when it was getting launched. So these are some uh, trials for, uh, you know, so there are other newer trials like the Kite and Kaiser, which are for brolicizumab and diabetic macular edema, which are also now uh, in the you know final stage of publication. So, uh, you know, so these are some industry driven trials, but, you know, we didn't have enough time to go over all of them. Apart from these, uh, I would request postgraduates to also not forget the ETDRS and the DRS trial, because they still form the basis of our definitions, uh, basics of our laser treatment, and for vitrectomy, when to do definitions of high risk PDR. A lot of examiners are still very fond of questioning on ETDRS and DRS trials also. So those are the hallmarks of like old time trials, so don't forget on those. Thank you, Dr. Sandeep uh, That was a very interesting uh, discussion, and we'll be carrying forward it next 
Friday. Uh, yes. Dr. Mary. Next class on Wednesday is on clinical trials in ARFD. So that that will be next Wednesday, coming Wednesday. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Thank you again, sir. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Hitesh. And Bye. I hope to see all of you next Friday. Bye. -bye.